In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. One of the interesting things about the letter of Paul to the Galatians is that it begins differently than any of the other letters he wrote. Usually, in the letters of St. Paul, he introduces himself, Paul, an apostle, so on and so forth, offers grace and peace through God the Father and through the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he goes into a section in which he prays for or thanks God for that particular group. I thank my God for you because of your great faith. Or I always hear about your love. So on and so forth. Always that opening prayer and thanksgiving. Gratitude for that particular congregation or those people. But not in the letter to the Galatians. In the letter to the Galatians... He introduces himself. He gives the, the grace and peace. And then he immediately lays in to the Galatians. It's as if he has an urgency about him that we're not going to waste time with, I've heard about your faith and love and all of that business. You've got a problem and we need to address it. So after all of the beginning formalities, he goes right in and says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, what is he talking about here? The rest of the letter is him having strong words for the Galatians who have embraced and accepted this alternative gospel, this false gospel. In other words, he's saying, I came to you preaching one thing, and some other folks came preaching something different, and now you've abandoned the true gospel to go with this false teaching. Now, not a very palatable sentiment in our age where, well, just everybody has their own truth, right? So let bygones be bygones. Different strokes for different folks, right? Uh, that's not how Paul, the apostle, lived his life. He had encountered the glorified and, resur and resurrected Christ. He had been taught and had the gospel revealed to him by God himself directly. And he wasn't about to let the Galatians wander off into some other message, some other gospel. What was that other gospel, that other message? Simply put, it was this. Christianity began as a Jewish movement. Everybody, to a person, was Jewish in the early Christian community. Well, then some Gentiles started believing in Jesus Christ, believing that he was the Lord and Savior of the world. Well, what do we do with them? Do they need to become Jews first and then believe in Jesus Christ? Or can you just come straight to Christ? And not have to do these things. That was a real bone of contention in the early church. Because some of the early believers said, you've got to do everything Moses commanded us to do. And believe in Christ. In short, you have to become a Jew on your way to becoming a Christian. But others said, no, Jew and Gentile come to Christ on the same terms on the same level ground, by the same means, the means of faith. Paul, of course, taught and preached that we come to God through Jesus Christ by faith. Whether you are a Jew and keep all the rituals of the Old Testament law, or whether you are a Gentile who's never even heard of them, you come to Jesus Christ by faith, and it is through faith in Jesus Christ that you become a member of God's people. So in other words, it no longer has to do with ethnicity. It no longer has to do with what your background is. It no longer has uh, to do with ritual purity or anything like that. It has to do with faith for Jew and Gentile alike. Well, the Galatians had some other folks who came and said, everything that Paul guy said was bull. You need to become Jewish. 
If you're not circumcised, you need to be circumcised. If you're not keeping the Sabbath, you need to keep the Sabbath. If you're not keeping the dietary laws and avoiding pork and shellfish, you need to avoid those things before you can come to Christ. And some of them were actually believing it. And we don't know why they were believing it. Well, I can think of a few reasons. I mean, wouldn't it be great to be able to, you know, think that you actually contributed something to your own salvation? I mean, that would be kind of a little point of pride, wouldn't it? You know, me and God got this working together as a team. Rather than humbling ourselves on our faces in humble gratitude to God for the sheer grace and gift of salvation, which comes to us by faith. That was Paul's passion, and that is uh, what he was about. And that's certainly what this letter to Galatians uh, is about. It was a matter of souls here for him. But you know, Paul was not the only one who revealed that truth. That you, don't, you didn't have to be of the people of Israel in order to come to Israel's Messiah. But we read about that in this morning's Gospel. According to St. Luke, Jesus had ended his sayings in the hearing of the uh, in the hearing of the people. He entered Capernaum. A centurion, now that was a, a, a Roman soldier uh, who commanded a group of soldiers. So this isn't just any Roman soldier, but this is a, a leader among Roman soldiers. And he had a slave who was dear to him, who was sick and at the point of death. And he somehow got wind of Jesus, this Jewish wandering healer type. And he heard that he had some interesting powers. Power, period. And so when he heard of Jesus, he sent, he, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his slave. He didn't even go on his own. And they came to Jesus, and they made the request on his behalf. And they said, he's worthy to have you come do this, because he loves our nation. He's not one of us, but he loves our nation. And he built us our synagogue, and probably attended the synagogue. And, and he loves the law of Moses, and all of these things. He's what would have been called back then a God-fearer. Not one who converted, you know, uh, all on... To Judaism, uh, but rather kept as much as he could of it as the Gentiles. At any rate, Jesus went with them. And when they were not far from the house, the centurion friend sent more friends to him, saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself. I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. He's explaining, okay, here's why I sent people. It's not that I'm too important to actually come out and talk to you myself. It's because I'm not worthy to be in your presence. Now this is a powerful man. Here is one who is not accustomed to humbling himself before anybody. But he stands before people. Tells them what to do. Where to go. And yet, he counted himself unworthy to have Jesus even come to his home. He says, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. This Gentile was not circumcised. This Gentile did not keep all of the law of Moses. He was not of the tribe, so to speak. But what he had is what Paul would later write, we all need to have, which is a faith which exalts Jesus Christ and humbles ourselves. A faith which exalts Christ and humbles ourselves. Most of the time, we've got it backwards. Christ is too small in our lives and in our vision and in our hearts. We have tamed him, domesticated him, Try to bring him uh, onto, into our entourage to sort of help our life go along however, you know, however we're trying to make it go. And we ourselves loom large and at the very center of our lives. For this centurion, it was different. The centurion saw himself as unworthy. 
of the presence of Christ. He saw himself as insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but he exalted the Lord Jesus Christ. He believed Christ was enough. Christ was powerful enough. Christ was big enough. Christ was loving enough. He says, just say the word, Jesus, and let my servant be healed. I'm a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and, and come, and he comes. In other words, he's saying, I, I, I get you. I have this authority over a group of people, and I tell one where to go, and, and they go there. But you, you're the son of God. You can tell this sickness to go away, and it will. So please, do that for my servant. He doesn't even ask for himself. Do this for, for my dear slave. And Jesus marveled. Why did he marvel at this? He said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. His own countrymen failed to see him for who he truly was. His own countrymen failed to respond to him as God would have them respond. Jesus' own countrymen magnified things that should have been made much smaller, and they made much smaller Jesus, who should have been magnified and exalted. But this Gentile centurion got it. Now, as a centurion, he may have loved the Jews, but I guarantee you, not all the Jews loved him. It doesn't matter how many synagogues you build. One, you're not Jewish. Two, you're Roman. Three, you're a Roman soldier. Four, you're in charge of a bunch of Roman soldiers. And yet this is the example that Jesus gives of faithful response to the Messiah. Because for that centurion, God was big. Christ was exalted. And he was small. Paul, at the end of today's reading from the Galatians says, if anybody comes and preaches to you a gospel contrary to what you've heard from me already, let them be accursed. Even if an angel comes and preaches something different, let them be accursed. Paul lived in an age, and we too live in an age, where there are all kinds of alternative gospels preached to us. The church lives in the temp under the temptation to change things around to make things a little more palatable. You know, do a focus group. Do some market research and change the message accordingly. Now, there are things in the church that are going to change. You know, music styles may change. Buildings might change. Vestments might change. Things like that. But the message never changes. And so often, the reason that we want the message to change is because our God is too small. And we are too big for our bridges. Or anything else. God is not interested in a false modesty or false humility that beats ourselves around and makes uh, self-deprecating comments, things like that. That's not the humility that Scripture talks about. The humility the Bible commands us is a humility that sees God for who he truly is in order that we might see ourselves for who we really are. We need to ask ourselves from time to time, is the God that I worship, the God that I pray to, the God revealed in Jesus Christ, the God of the Old and New Testaments, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or is that God to whom I pray or to that I worship a sort of hybrid creation of my own, with bits and pieces of this, that, or the other thing, perfectly designed to fit my busy life, like everything else on the market these days, perfectly designed to, to, to fit our lives. Do we want a God who fits our lives, or are we willing to be a person who fits, whose life fits in to God, who is greater more exalted, more magnified, and more glorious than we could ever actually see him to be on this side of glory. But I pray that as we meditate and ponder what the centurion did and, and what he said, 
that we might have a little more of his attitude in ourselves and among ourselves. Seeing God in all of his greatness, in all of his glory, in all his magnificence, in order that we may see ourselves for who we really are. Unworthy, yes, but deeply loved and cherished as well. And as we receive the Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist, when we come to him in prayer, when we're in his presence as we gather in worship, may the cry of our hearts be the cry of the centurion's lips. Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and I shall be healed. He'll say the word, but he will come under our roof too, because it's not about our worthiness to have him, but about his love for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.